Welcome to Olympian Method, the show where we ask the deep questions in philosophy. But we need your help uncovering the true answers. So please like, subscribe, hit the bell, post your comments and thoughts below. We really appreciate it. So, Sean, we've been, uh, we've been unpacking a little bit about freedom, and we've mentioned a couple things in the previous chapter that I want to unpack or focus on for this time around. And so one thing that came up was the notion of determinism. Mm -hmm. What's your understanding of what it means to have a deterministic world, or what, the, what does that entail? So I think, I, I guess, the, the ad infinitum, ultimate, uh, strict, absolutist version of determinism is, is just that. It's, an absolute, it's that everything has a sort of absolute quality, that it couldn't have happened any other way, that everything that will happen, there's no other way for it to happen. Right. So like, a, one, like, a, like a, a, one, a playlist that you can't change that's already set in motion. Okay. It's like we're living out of play and the script's already been written. We're just yeah. actors that are, you know, reciting lines, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. Sounds a little bit fatalistic in a way, but... Uh, it is. And I, um, I, and I don't think that's necessarily what reality is, but that's what determinism definition, definitionally speaking is. So, how, so next thing I want to, like, in relation to that, what's your understanding of what it means to have causality? Because I think this is actually something that humans are notoriously bad at, and I think it's one of the things that leads to our problems with this whole notion. Mm -hmm. well, well, first off, I think it is a problem that we, that we tend to look at the cause of, of things incorrectly. Yeah. Uh, science tries to correct for that, I think, by in implementing the notion of correlation, where you look at the, um, an event that happens and you look at all the aspects of reality that led up to that event. For example, I think I talked about a drunk driving you know, accident that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, person drinks 12 beers in the course of two hours and decides to drive home, runs a red light and ends up hitting somebody. You know, what is the cause of death? You could, you could frame that in a couple of different ways. You could look at it, well, the cause of death happens when the brain, you know, hits, hits the inside of the skull and then it causes like hemorrhaging in the brain and then, you know, the person dies from in, in, internal hemorrhaging in the brain. There's no other way to, to say it. Or is it because when, when the head hits the dashboard or hits the airbag really hard? Mm. Or is it because of when the car hit the object that causes the airbag to deploy, or is it because of the is it because of the guy who ran the is it because the guy ran the red light? Is that all a causal factor linked to the drinking? From a societal standpoint, we tend to think that it is. That's why we have laws in terms of justice revolved around DUIs. Yeah, I think part of it too is we like to, as humans, try to resolve or sort of uh, simplify down the nature of causality to say like one factor, like you were saying, we like to, mm -hmm. we are limited in our ability to understand that whole chain of causality that leads up to a particular event. Right. And so we try to sort of dumb that down in a way to like, what is the primary cause of something, even if there isn't necessarily any one that's more important than the others. Right. Which is, so means, it almost means that causality is kind of an illusion, basically. Kind of. But or or at least the way we think about causality is an illusion. Like well, we, it, we, we don't we don't take in all the all the this extraneous information that maybe doesn't matter or does. I, I'm not sure how to how to say it. Yeah, I mean the more positive way of looking at it is it's like it's an abstraction if it becomes yes. useful for us to think about. Not it an way. illusion, but an abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. So because it's it's not like we're wrong in thinking about that. It's just we are overly simplistic in thinking what we think about causality. Right. I. I. I exactly. And I'm. I, the only way that I can really think about in terms of causality is like through in inductive reasoning, really. It's actually really hard to deduce causality. I think you had mentioned like, what if there was an AI program that could take in all of this information and like accurately determine, you know, every aspect of reality, like mm -hmm. the, the kind of kind of that thought experiment. Right. And that's something I can't even wrap my head around because I'm just a limited being who doesn't have access to that right. information. So I can only make limited decisions about and determinations about causality based on what I perceive. So, so you mentioned decision in there, and that's actually one of the things I want to talk about is what makes something a decision? What, how, do, how does the process of deciding work? I okay. think this is an important part of freedom as well. Right, because I guess when you think about it in terms of our mind and our conscious mind, or we'll just use the conscious mind like a planning, the planning area of the brain, like the executive functions, like yeah. neurons firing, like a neuron firing is almost kind of like a, a bit in a computer being processed as a zero or a one. Mm -hmm. There's been that connection between computer science and psychology for a long time. Uh, I just lost my train of thought. My neurons are not firing correctly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I might need to eat. But anyways, it, um, where I was going with that is the, the notion that I choose to make those neurons fire is, I think, the, 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 the notion where the notion of a decision kind of 
breaks down. The, the notion of a decision doesn't necessarily always happen from a top-down function. It can happen, happen from a bottom-up yeah. function. So let, let, me, let me paint a little picture here for you if it, if it helps. So we, we tend to think of certain actions or certain functions of our body as happening sort of autonomously or happening without us having to decide. And those things are things like, generally speaking, our heart beating or you know, producing various uh, you know, subs various cells and th organisms that are having to like do their biological functions. We think of most of that as happening without a decision occurring in our in our mind, right? But then we also think of, of like a, a fairly small slice of our experience or our actions as being driven by decisions. This is and true. What, so what do we think makes those special, other than the fact that we think about them consciously? Is there anything else besides that? Well, that's something that comes to mind is the notion of gut bacteria, actually, and the influence that that has on the mind. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, there's the saying that you are what you eat, right? But your gut bacteria actually is described as your second brain. Obviously, there's no real aspect of your consciousness. There's, the consciousness does not come from your stomach outward or your gut outward. You know, it comes, as far as we know. As far as we know. <laughs> but it influences it. So, for example, you eat a certain type of food, it makes you feel kind of groggy and, and gross, like, like I personally don't eat gluten, mm -hmm. just because it makes me feel slow. And it's not that I'm gluten intolerant, I just don't feel good when I eat gluten. And, and as an example, so it's like I'm conscious of the fact that it makes me feel that way. And so I am now able to make a decision, well, I can make a correlation or I can make a causal relation, even if it's not actual causality, but the fact of eating gluten causing me to feel a certain way yeah. leads me to say, well, the next best decision for you to make in terms of your health is to not eat gluten. But then there's also the part of me that's like, but I really, really like cinnamon rolls. So mm. it's like, I really like that taste. So it's like, my needs are in conflict. My taste buds are telling me, oh, this is really good. This is sugar. And, 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 and it's, 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 it gives you energy. It tastes good. Um, but you know, later on in the process when you're digesting, it's, it's, it's taking away your energy. It's actually making you not, not feel as healthy. So there's almost like uh, the conscious decision to, to not or to, to eat or not to eat cinnamon rolls? That is the question. That is the question. To be or not to be, that is the question. To eat or not to eat. We should, we should add that to our merch line. So, <laughs> to think or not to think. So, good question. Um, can you choose to think? Can you choose well, to choose? Let me think about that. Ah! <laughs> so, we just got so meta. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I, I like what you were just saying about the whole notion of having like a, a diet that's sort of choosing, it's, it's, it gets back to the meta once, and I'm curious which parts in that chain do you think are decisions? Is, ah. is, the, is the actual choosing not to eat, to eat or not to eat the decision, or is the decision about trying to affect the, those other decisions, the meta wants about the other desires? Um, again, I don't know if I'm choosing to go down this route, but I will because I think it's relevant. It's yeah. like when you're talking about like depression, for example, there's an actual measurable difference in serotonin levels and the way that the hormones in the body interact, which is why antidepressants work for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't work for everyone, but they do work for a lot of people. And they're, good, they're a good tool. And what they do is, is it helps regulate the serotonin levels. And obviously, where I'm kind of going with that is it's like, if, if you're aware, like, like I said like our, in the previous chapter, where freedom is limited by our ability to sort of know our environment and interact with our environment, mm -hmm. once you consider your biological uh, substructures like the serotonin structures in your brain and even the physical structures of the neurons in your brain as giving you the ability to think, once you become aware of that, it almost becomes a part of your environment. Mm. And you can choose to interact with that as if it's something that's outside of yourself, even though it's actually internal. Does that make sense? And I think that's where mindfulness comes into play. So I think that the ability to decide to do that, it, it's really a blurry line. Like, am I choosing to, you know, eat a healthy diet because my mind is already healthy enough to make that decision? Or it, 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 the causality loop kind of becomes, but, but life is kind of about a series of, of uh, uh, positive feedback loops. Hmm. That kind of defines life. Life itself is a positive feedback loop. As soon as life happens, we start reproducing that creates more life more life more life it, it, it's like to to those that have everything everything more will be given to those that have nothing that everything will be taken away like it's very easy for life to continue to make life and it's almost impossible for something that's not living to become living mm -hmm. does that make sense so our, our our decisions i think are rooted in our core 
desire, our core will to live, and all life does this. Like if a tree, for example, is is um, being blocked by by sunlight, it will actually like grow and move to like m grow into the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about plants as having free will, but maybe there's an element of will or some aspect of consciousness that's moving us down that road. Hmm. So like in my case, like I battled with depression for a long time, and I was like you know I self medicated with things like pot, and and it's like. Maybe I didn't have a decision on whether I chose to do that, but once I realized like, hey, this positive feedback loop isn't going where I want it, it's actually starting to cause a negative feedback loop. Like every time I try to smoke now, it's almost like it makes me not want to do it ever again. Now mm -hmm. I'm at the point where it's like, I really don't feel like I don't really want to do it yeah. for at least a very, very long time, like years and years. Like I have no desire to go back to it. Mm -hmm. But I think that that decision is fundamentally based off of all the structures in my body kind of working in unison and harmony in concert with each other to say, well, that, that wasn't making things better. Meditating every day does make things better. Mm. So keep doing that. And now I'm in a process where for like the past week, I've more or less been meditating every single day, mostly about actually by past three days. So, okay. but I think that's kind of where the notion of decision comes in. And I knew that meditation was good for me. This is the part that's crazy. <laughs> I knew meditation was good for me. I knew pot was smoking bad for a long time, but I continued to to engage in that positive feedback loop. So when you look at people who have like addictions, I think that's a good case study of, of choice mm -hmm. because you clearly know that drinking until the point you pass out or doing cocaine to the point where you almost have a heart attack is bad for you. It's counter to survival. So why are you making the decision to do that? Is it because of a faulty biological process or is it because your will and your consciousness of, of the human consciousness sense is is weak. Yeah, I think part part of it is are you really at that point are you are you making those decisions anymore, or is there another process like another instinct or whatever that's taken over your will or your ability to make decisions? That's part of what I'm trying to get at here. Right. Well, in the addiction community, they actually describe it as a disease. Mm. Like it's like a learned process and a learned behavior, and it's a combination of having instant gratification and sort of a lack of planning. It actually like separates the outer regions of the brain from the, the, the midbrain, the amygdala, the, uh, not the nucleus that combines all of these things that sort of regulate our, our dopamine and our reward system, right? Mm -hmm. But you can, once you're aware that, of how to make those connections, like I said, it's a part of the environment. Once you become self-aware of that aspect of your structures, it's like a part of your environment. Mm -hmm. You can choose to modify it. So I actually didn't really make strides in my own addiction recovery until I knew that. That was kind of like the missing piece. Like once I became aware, hey, I need and to. I think that that's why a lot of people end up needing to go into some sort of treatment program because they need to be, they need to learn how to rewire those systems and they may not know that themselves. Well, right. Well, it's like if you need to know how to fix a car, you need to know how a car works, right? Right. <laughs> well, do we even really know how we work though? We don't, but we're, but the striving to understand how we work, I think is why science is so important. Right. So. So I, I, I want to take it back just for a second to uh, the causality aspect of things, mm -hmm. because I think that's another area where our, our assumptions or our impressions of our decisions are sort of, we, we talked about as like sort of like an oversimplification of what's actually going on here, right? Because mm -hmm. we, you, I mean, you talked about it with the car example, with the um, driving, drunk, drunk driving case is there's like this whole chain and any point you decide to stop in the chain of causality in terms of the events and factors that led up to something is in some ways arbitrary. And this mm -hmm. is what can get you to determinism is if you account for all the factors that led up to a particular thing, it's like where, where in that point do you leave room for the ability to make a decision or have free will? Mm -hmm. Once you start incorporating enough factors, it's like, well, given all of this that happened before, it's, is that inevitable? Mm -hmm. Or is there some element that's still you know, left up to your own will at that mm -hmm. point? So two things, art imitates life and RPG video games. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm going somewhere with this. So in an RPG video game, I think a lot of people have played those, there are moments where you get to make decisions about your quest in the story. And, right. and I think that's a real imitation of what life is. There are certain moments where you get to make very key decisions, mm -hmm. but everything that kind of happens in between is almost like an automated program. Like if you, once you decide to drink 10 beers, for example, you automatically kind of set in, set in, set in motion that aspect of, uh, more inhibition, more likely to make impulsive decisions, less likely to make responsible decisions, like in, in car and driving. Um, so I think as for, if you were to weight the causality in that context again, it's like, back to the RPG thing, it's like, that's, that's some, I, you can almost think about, it's pragmatic, I think, to think about that in terms of, that is the ultimate decision is, do you even choose to drink? Hmm. 
But are you saying once you make that decision, you become somewhat of an NPC in the game analogy there? Or do you still retain your free will in that situation? Well, I think you don't become an NPC. You do still have some aspect of will that's there. I don't know how free it is because it's been compromised by an external force, so mm -hmm. to speak. And maybe that's something we can talk about is like, you know, the limitations of freedom kind of being like, is there an external force preventing you from moving? Mm. Like, for example, if you have like uh, a, a severed spinal cord, you, 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 your muscles have the ability to move your legs, but the signal can't get there. Right. So. Yeah, so I, I think just to sort of, we're, we're going to wrap up this section here on the determinism and causality. I think one, one thing we can sort of agree on is that there's way too many factors that go into causality for us to comprehend what's going on there. And so I think one of the notions that we have in terms of like decisions that happen in our mind is we, we try and condense that all down, collapse it all into like a single moment in time that is the decision, mm -hmm. even if it's the reality is way more complex than that, just because it's, it's like a, it's kind of like an abstraction like we were talking about. It's, it's kind of a necessary um, mechanism for us to be able to comprehend sort of the nature of what, what's happening around us and what we're deciding or what we're doing, I should say. Right. And, 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 to relate it back to old topics just briefly, that, that notion of a sort of a singularity of, hey, that's the point of causation, kind of is how we think about morality too. Yeah, I mean, decisions play a big part in, in morality, obviously, because we certainly weight the, um, the decisions someone makes heavily in terms of whether a, whether a particular uh, situation is more like morally good or bad, morally right. good or evil even. Well, I think in this context, drunk driving is probably yeah, well. <laughs> in any context. Yeah, I mean, we, we can probably agree that causing harm to yourself as a result of crashing a car while drunk driving is bad. And so then it's and like- Causing harm to others too is- Yeah, potentially crashing into someone else. And so it's like, where in that causation do you lay the, the I think blame is a big part of this too, as part of like the decisions, right? Yeah, where do you, and blame implies responsibility. So not only causality, but responsibility too. Where's the point of responsibility? Right, but I think that by trying to associate a single point of causality, you're kind of also assigned blame for a particular outcome to that moment of cause out to whatever was the cause right like we could have a whole debate about whether the point was drinking because I'm not gonna say don't drink I, <laughs> I still sometimes you know drink drink beer but it's like is it was it the decision to get into the car but maybe that decision to get into the car was influenced by the alcohol mm. but here's the thing that decision to drink the alcohol was influenced by something else maybe you had a really rough childhood and that's <laughs> why you were drinking 10 beers that night yeah so is it your father's fault for beating you into submission when you were 10 years old and you didn't deserve it that you decide to drink right but it, getting into the car might be because of uh, some circumstance that limits your options for transportation which might you know be part of the cause as well and maybe you didn't prepare for the situation where you were drinking and you were left without a way to, to leave the situation right and i've i've seen that happen many yeah. times all right well i think uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up there for the, the this part of the discussion okay well hey, hey. <laughs> later olympians later